Amen. They are awesome. That is sure. Yes. Yes. I told them in early service, sometimes you come and you just, uh, after the worship service, you just feel like, I just go home and be full. But you ain't a going. You're staying here for another hour. But it's great to be out here. For those of you that don't know me, I think I know almost everybody, but um, I'm Pastor Scotty. I'm uh, like the third or fourth stringer around here. So for you Colts fan, I am the Scott Tolzien of the pastor team. So, so it's great to be up here. Um, we're going to kind of get into it a little bit here. Last week we saw how Jesus was, was being confronted uh, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, basically the religious leaders of the day. Uh, he was being confronted, and they kept trying to trick him or trap him in his words uh, so that they could turn the people against him. And we saw that every time they did, he had an answer, right? And he came right back at them to show them why they were wrong and why their thinking or their faith was, was jaded or blind. Um, and in fact, he, he dishonored them really a lot with how he taught them. And he said, you know, don't you know the scripture? Haven't you read or are you error in the word? And he, taught, and he really discredited them really bad about, you know, the scripture and really how he lived his life. They couldn't, they couldn't find anything to entrap him in because obviously Jesus is perfect. But they kept going at him. And finally, in verse, uh, the end of chapter 22, we saw that it says that after that encounter, no one dared ask Jesus another question. They were tired of getting made to look like punks, right? They were getting made a fool of every time they tried to trick Jesus. He, just, he would shut them down. And it's not so much that they didn't want to ask him any questions in the sense that they were okay, let's just, let's just let him be and he'll do his thing and he'll fizzle out. They hated him. They hated him. They want him dead now at this point. It's not about just shutting him up. It's about now they're starting to look for ways that they can, they can get him out of the picture. They want him dead here at this point. So um, let's go ahead and we're going to say a prayer here and then we'll get into, uh, we'll get into the word a little bit. Heavenly Father, we come here this morning, Lord, and uh, God, we know that there's many here, Lord, that are burdened, many that are weighed down, uh, so many hearts trouble, God, but we just pray that uh, this morning we would be able to leave it outside the door, that our hearts would be focused on you, God, that you would speak to us this morning. God, we know sometimes your, your word, we agree with it, sometimes it's hard to swallow, but God, we know that your word is perfect. So we just pray that you would bless us this morning, God, to receive your word, and we bless that your word would go forth and do all and accomplish all that you sent it forth to do. Help our hearts to be ready for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so have you guys ever done something in front of your uh, spouse or maybe your children or something like that that doesn't really, doesn't really line up with kind of what you've been trying to teach them throughout their lives? The example that you've been trying to set for them. Anybody ever done that? Yep, many a time. So uh, I know for me, I have on a few a ti- few times, not many, but there's been a few uh, that I've let my competitiveness uh, get in the way and maybe not be a good example or my anger or my flesh somehow sometimes gets in the way of what I am trying to live an example out. Uh, to my family and to my kids and and those that you know that I love and of course usually you know my loving family has always been there uh, to say and especially it's been Chase my middle son good job pastor right that's what Chase says why don't you practice what you preach good job pastor but they're all they've always been there to tell me that and that's kind of where um, that's kind of where Jesus is at here Jesus is at the point, remember, this is the last week uh, that he'll be here on this earth before he's crucified. And he's kind of at the point now, he is fed up with these religious leaders who uh, they say one thing and they do another. They preach this holy gospel, but then they live a life that doesn't live up or doesn't go in accordance to what, what the word of God says. And he's fed up at this point, and basically that's what he's telling them here as we get into the study is why don't you practice what you preach. If you say it, do it. Live the example that you're trying to, trying to teach. And that's where we're going to pick up here. So now he's, he's been, like I said, he's kind of slammed and, and beaten down these religious leaders, right? And now he's, like I said, he's kind of done with them. And now he's turning his attention to the people. 
and to his disciples because he's got a couple days here before he's crucified. And he's wanting to really get this stuff ingrained in them that uh, what he wants to teach him. So in Matthew 23, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 3. It says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you to do and observe, uh, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. So we just kind of talked about that. He, Jesus is keeping on the offensive here, and he's really just getting plain and to the point. He says they don't practice what they preach. Uh, they're terrible examples of God's word, and you should not follow the things that they do. Listen to the God's word. God's law is perfect, but don't follow what they do because they're terrible examples of that. And this obviously this chair of Moses that they're talking about is not a literal chair, uh, or else they would all be fighting to be the one sitting in it, right? It's about 10 of them in there fighting over it. It's, it's actually what it means is just that they, they are the authority. God has set up this system. Moses was the mouthpiece for God. Moses was that go-between the people and God. And now he has come down and devolved down to these religious leaders, these Pharisees and these Sadducees, and they have that position. We're going to read a little bit about uh, Moses here in Exodus 18. It says, it came about the next day that Moses uh, sat to judge the people, and the people stood about Moses from the morning until evening. Now when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge, and all the people stand about you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When, the, when they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes uh, of God and his laws. So God had given this or charged this to Moses. He had the authority, and now it had come down to these Pharisees and Sadducees, and they were the people that the common Jew was to look up to. That's how it was set up. They should have been the example for these people to live their life, but they weren't. They were just content on being in the position and not living out the position that they were supposed to be so in matthew 22 again it says therefore all that they do all that they tell you do and observe but do not do according to their deeds for they say these things and do not do them so jesus tells them that to follow their religious leaders as far as what they say but don't do what they do this sta statement seems kind of strange because you know over and over again we've seen jesus tell the people the people that these pharisees are erred in the word right are they they misuse the word or they're wrong in their interpretation of the word. Uh, but what, again, what he's saying here is it's not a blanket statement to follow everything that they say, but he's saying you have God's word here. Anything that they tell you to do inside of God's word, you should do it. You should respect the position that they're in and do God's word. Just like we're taught over and over again to respect authority. You, we as Christians should be the best citizens, and I think Ben talked about it last week, or Nate, uh, that we can be. We should always be the best citizen that we can be, and always follow authority up into the, word, the time that it goes against God's word. And that's what that Jesus is telling these Jewish people here is, follow the word, respect the position, but don't, don't do what they do, because they're leading you the wrong way. And let's uh, move on here. And you can see examples in 1 Peter chapter 2 about this. You can see examples uh, of Paul, and I think it's Acts chapter 23 when he was in front of the religious leaders. He respected still the authority that was over him. He didn't agree with it, but he respected the authority. Um, and then in verse 3, Jesus is telling the people again, all that they do from Scripture, all that they tell you that lines up with Scripture, do it. And that's a charge to us as Christians. We need to know the Word of God. What you hear on Sunday morning should not be the only scripture that you hear. You should be reading the scripture. You should be testing the word against what anybody tells you. Don't take it because anyone stands up and, and claims a position of authority. Don't take it as always truth. That's how cults are started. When people don't know the word and they just blindly follow. And it's a blind faith that's not what God asked for. God wants you to know the word and all that lines up with the word, you do. And if it doesn't, don't do it. Don't follow him. And in the next few verses, Jesus is going to give an example or examples of why the people should not follow these religious leaders of the day. In Matthew 23, 4, 
Jesus says, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them uh, with so much as a finger. Jesus tells these people that, you know, they, they make all these rules and all these laws, and they had thousands of them. It wasn't just the law that, God, that Moses brought down from God. It was thousands and thousands of rules. And then they had a book that explained the rules that they had to know how to follow. They were weighing these people down so much that they, they, they were given up. They were so hard-pressed and burdened that they were just given up because they could not keep up with what these, these religious leaders were trying to get them to do, just like churches do today. Anybody ever been in one? You know, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to say this, you got to say that, you got to listen to this, can't dress like that. And they put these rules up here on the wall. The Word of God is not taught. As long as you can keep that thousand, those thousand rules, you're fine. Don't worry about the Word of God. You just do what we tell you to do and live how we tell you to live, and you'll be okay. That's a danger in a lot of churches today. You know, the law itself is impossible to keep, right? That's why Jesus had to come, because we couldn't keep the law in and of itself. Why are we adding another thousand rules to something that we already can't keep? It made no sense, but it was just a way for those, those religious leaders to get power over the people and to keep them in subjection to them. Acts chapter 15, uh, we'll read a little bit about this. It said, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, is it necessary to circumcise them to direct them to observe the laws of Moses? The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by the mouth of the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows the heart testifies to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did also to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon on their neck, the neck of the disciples, a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Again, it's just like what he's saying here. Why are you burdening down the people with more rules? They can't keep what we've already told them they had to keep. So why do we keep laying down rules and laws that they can't keep? It makes no sense, and it just turns people away from God because eventually you give up. I was there. I gave up. I came there wanting to know how to be better and to get right. But all I was told is you're worthless. All I was told is here's a thousand rules. All I was told is go search for yourself. That's not what God intended. These people had gotten so twisted and so so far from, from what God had really intended and, and what the rule said that they would be mad at Jesus when he healed somebody because it was on the Sabbath. When God had told them over and over again, love justice, love mercy, love grace, walk humbly with your God, it went totally against what God had been teaching these people, but because it didn't line up with their rules, they hated Jesus for it. And there's so many churches that way that just want power and control over people, and they do it by rules. And then that brings us to us. We're broken, right? We're all here. We're broken. We've all been here. We've been broken. We've been searching. We've been weighed down. We're weary, and we're sick, and we're tired, and we need Jesus. And we know we're lost. Right? We, we knew we were lost when we got here. We knew we were lost before we trusted Jesus. We didn't need somebody to tell us and beat us down with it. We knew that. And we knew that we couldn't do what they were telling us to do. Go clean yourself up and then come back. I'm here because I can't clean myself up. I'm like the little two-year-old in Walmart. You know what I mean? I can't clean myself up. And the beautiful thing is, is that Jesus said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about what they're doing. You, you listen to me, and it's not go and clean yourself up and come back. God is not about keeping a list of do's and a list of don'ts to prove that you're worthy of him. God is about a relationship with Jesus. If you'll give yourself to him and trust him, that, that's what matters. That's what God is about. Matthew 11 gives us a great promise from Jesus. 
It says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When all these religious leaders and everyone else is like these religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus says, come. I'm here. I'm waiting for you. I've got grace. I'm going to give it to you. You just trust me. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't worry about the rules on the wall. You come and you trust me and you build that relationship with me because that's what Christianity is. It's not rules and regulations. It's relationship. And then Jesus goes on from there, and he's going to show these, again, some more of these faults with these religious leaders. And us as Christians today, we, we should really take heed of these because um, the big church, the big C church, has really fallen uh, to a lot of these same practices. Matthew 27, it says, But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and they lengthen their tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues, and they love the respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. So these phylacteries there, in the Greek word, it means to guard or, or preserve and basically, they were just little, like, wooden boxes that they would keep Scripture on their arm with, or some of them put it on their forehead. Um, and it's, it's a great practice, but it got perverted again. And you can read about that in Deuteronomy and in Numbers also. Uh, we're not going to read there, but it just got perverted. And it was supposed to be a way for people to remember the Word of God and to cherish the Word of God so that they didn't fall into sin. It was keeping the word of God close to you so that you didn't stray from the word of God. But what it turned into and what it perverted into was just a religious practice so they could show how righteous they were. So, you know, I got my little six by six inch prayer box on my, on my sleeve. And then guess what? Lonnie comes out and his is eight by eight. <laughs> and then Hank's is 10 by 10. And then my tassels looks like one of Elvis's costumes, right? And it's flowing down to the ground. It just became a competition because I want you to know how righteous I am and how good I am and how perfect I am. And that's all that it, all that it came down to. What was good and what God intended for good, man again got involved and perverted and messed up and took away what, what really God intended for it to be. Has anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever done that? Broaden their phylacteries or lengthen their tassels? Come on. I'm not talking literally. I'm talking about you do something to be shown. We've all done it. Raise your hands. I would venture to guess that we've all done it. Many of us in here have done a good deed just so we could be noticed. You know, we, we've dropped groceries off at, at someone that maybe needs it. And we can't be content with that, can we? Here's what we do. Instagram, just doing the work of the Lord because I love Jesus, dropping this food off to this hungry person. <laughs> That's what we do. Or, oh, this, this isn't good enough. This post isn't. Get this homeless guy in here. I fed this homeless guy today. <laughs> and then we check our Facebook. Did I get 100 likes? We're so, we want people to know how good we are. And we've done it. We're no better than the ones we make fun of and the old, you know, the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We're no better. We do it too on a different way. We still do it. We have to know that people know. We have to post it all over Facebook so we can get the pats on the back. We want everybody to know how good we are. Let's read in Matthew here. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you that they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your hand, left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be done in secret, and, in your, and your Father who sees that is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not... ...may be seen by men. 
Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I mean, his command's pretty simple there, isn't it? Don't do it for the pats on the back. Don't do it to be noticed. Do it because you love God. That's why you should do it. Don't seek the approval of men. Be content and joyful in the fact that I know that God has seen it. I don't have to have 100 Facebook likes to know that I've done something good. I don't have to know that the whole world sees it to know that I did something good. The apostles turned the world upside down, right? They didn't have Facebook. They did it by loving each other, by being there for one another. That's how they turned the world upside down. Not because they put a post on Facebook of some homeless guy you probably dropped 50 cents in their bucket. That's how they turned the world upside down was by loving one another. And in verse 3, Jesus says, don't even let your left hand know what your right is doing. That seems strange. I believe, honestly, what he's saying here is don't even think about it. You don't even think about what you just did and harp on it because then you're going to get proud of it. And you're going to swell up with pride. And we know what happens with pride. What happens after pride? What comes? Destruction. If you're living a good Christian life, it should just flow from you. It should just, the love and mercy and the grace that you show people should just flow from you. It shouldn't matter. People should just see it. It shouldn't have to be something I have to make sure everybody sees. Everybody's going to know it if you just live your life. Let it flow from you. That's what God intended for us. Let's move on here. And Jesus goes into another one of the reasons why uh, these people are not to be held up as examples. He says that they, they love to be called rabbi, and they love these great greetings in the marketplaces. And so what he's saying there is they, they want these positions, but they don't want to do the work that God called for those positions to do. They were supposed to be there for the people. You know, if you get into ministry because you want something out of it, that's the wrong reason to get into ministry. You get into ministry because God has called you to it and because you have a heart for his people. There's so many people that go into ministry for what they can get out of it. And they, want, they wanted that fame and they want those, you know, rabbi was, it meant teacher or ma really master. These people would submit themselves to their rabbi and they would sit under them and they really looked up to them beyond anything. And Jesus said, don't, don't clamor to be called that. Why does it matter? And these people, they love to be called that because they want that authority over you. They want that position and that title, but they don't want to do what God called that position to be. And then Jesus, after condemning them, he goes on here to tell the people, and he starts to flip it upside down on really what Christian living is and really what he's called us to be. In Matthew 23, verses 8 through 10, Jesus said, But do not be called rabbi. For one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders. For one is your leader, and that is Christ. You know, Jesus here isn't speaking of like calling my dad my father. Jesus is saying nobody should take the authority of God Almighty in your spiritual sense. In your spiritual life, you have Jesus. You should not worship anybody else but him. And you should not take anybody else as authority over him. He is the authority. That's why we need to know the word of God. Don't pastor worship, basically, is what he's saying. And don't cling to be a pastor or a leader so you can get that worship. I don't want anybody to look to me and worship me. I want people to look to Jesus. I want my life to reflect and have people look at Jesus for it. Again, that's how cults are started when, when people just start worshiping their leaders. Jesus said, don't. Don't cling for that position. If you're a leader, people are naturally going to follow. You shouldn't fight and scratch and claw to be it. People are going to follow you naturally. Don't make that your desire. The only reason. What is your motivation for doing it? 
basically is what Jesus is saying. And their reason was is because they wanted the authority. They wanted the power. They wanted the money and everything else that came with it. Basically, check, check what you're doing it for. That's really what Jesus is saying here. God should have first place in everything in our lives. No one should have any authority over him. But so many people, they put their pastor on a pedestal, and he becomes who they look to. When they have a problem, it's they have to run to him instead of running to God. And I'm not saying, obviously, I want you to talk to your pastor, but I'm saying God is the one. Jesus is the one who made provision for all of your problems. Don't pastor worship. And if you're a pastor, don't seek the worship. So then that sets up the last few verses here in Matthew chapter 23. Jesus says, Matthew 23, 11 through 12, it says, But the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. So Jesus puts a big twist, right, on what really what all of us have been taught, certainly on what these religious leaders were doing, and he puts a big twist on even what we've been taught. Because our whole lives, what have we been taught? Look out for number. I don't care who you step on or who you hurt to get to the top, you get there. Step on as many hands or heads as it takes, but you get to the top. That's what we're taught. That's what the world wants us to buy into and believe. And that's not the way that it's supposed to be. Jesus flips it up. Jesus says, you want to be great in my kingdom? You put yourself last. You want to be a leader? Learn how to serve. Don't desire to be first. You live your life full of love, mercy, and grace. Love one another. Love God. All that stuff is going to come. Because none of this earthly stuff matters, right? When you get to the kingdom, what do you want? When I get to heaven, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my rest. Here's your reward. I don't need the pats on the back here. All that stuff is not eternal. It's not going to last. Somehow we've gotten the idea that to humble ourselves means that we're weak. That somebody, somebody's got something over on us. We can't stand that. We cannot stand to think that somebody has got something better than us or somebody has, is greater than us in some way. Jesus said, don't worry about it. You become a servant. You become last to be first. And then Jesus is going to, because Jesus, like he, he was talking about these religious leaders, and he said, do what they say and not what they do. But Jesus always gave us an example, right, to follow. Jesus never told us to do anything that he wouldn't do. So he gives us a great example in John chapter 13. John 13, uh, 5, Jesus says, Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded. And then drop down to chapter 12, it says, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. You know, and this is one of the, the biggest problems, again, in the church today, is we have so many Christians that are out there worried about how big their phylacteries are and how long their tassels are, instead of being at the feet of their brothers and sisters and uplifting and encouraging them on this walk. We're much more content in gossiping about a brother or sister than we are to help them. We just want to know what they did wrong so we can feel better about ourselves, right? And we can go talk to the, this person about them. That's not what God intended for us to be as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have too many people that are worried about appearing righteous instead of being righteous. We're no better than the ones that we sit and make fun of day after day, these religious leaders. We're no better. We do it. We just do it differently. 
That's not what Jesus intended for you. That's not what Jesus died for you for. Jesus died for you to be different, to be holy, to be set apart for something better than how the world is. That's not how he taught us to be. Philippians 2 says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection or, or compassion, make my joy complete, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. John 13, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That seems pretty simple. It didn't say anything about 100 Facebook likes, did it? As long as you get all these retweets. Nothing like that. Jesus says, love one another. Love God, love one another, and I'll change the world with you if you'll do that. If you'll just love God and love one another. Jesus is showing us what kingdom living is all about. And if that's your motivation, is to love God and love one another, your reward's going to be great in heaven. And before we close here, I just want to go over... Um, just one other thing here that God had kind of beat me up on personally, um, and God has put on my heart through this message, and it may just be for me. Um, you know, we talked about that statement, practice what you preach, right? And my son tells me that all the time, to practice what you preach. And we've all been told that. And what's our typical response? Do what I say and not what I do, right? That's, a, that's parenting 101. Do what I say and not what I do. And I know I use this a lot of times when I'm coaching. Do what I say and not what I do. Because I'm old now. You know, in my mind, I'm 26, but my body definitely is 46. I'm trying to teach spin moves in basketball, and I pull a hamstring. Or I'm trying to teach baseball, and I'm telling our kids to stay down on the ball, and I can't even bend down there to get down there. I mean, we were, me and uh, uh, our, my other coach, we were talking about uh, catching and getting down and blocking the ball and, you know, scooting to block the ball. And I said, we're just going to have to get videos because I can't show it. <laughs> so we're going to have to YouTube this and show it because I can't do it anymore. But we use that a lot. Do what I say or, or we say, don't judge me if we're talking about it in the Christian sense. That's our famous line is don't judge me. Don't judge me. I'm living better than Jenny. Right? Judge her. It's, it's easy to live better than Jenny. Right? <laughs> That shouldn't be our standard, but that's, that's what we say is don't judge me. Do, do what I say and not what I do. You know what I mean. And I hear so many Christians say that. Don't judge me. Don't follow me. Well, why not? Why shouldn't you want to be followed as a Christian? Why shouldn't you want your life to be an example for somebody? Is there a reason for that? But whether you like it or not, whether you want it to or not, you are an example to somebody on how a Christian should live. Almost every one of us in here have children or grandchildren, and you are exampling that life to them. So whether you like it or not, you're already being looked at as an example. You can't get out of it. So why not be the type of Christian that can say, yes, follow me, I'll be the example Don't give ourselves a pass because we want to give in to our flesh every time and say, well, don't follow me. Let's be the type of Christian that can stand up and say, yeah, I want to be that. Yeah, you judge me. You judge how I live my life, and you walk like how I live my life. Let's be that type of Christian. Why is it, why is it that Christian is the only title that we're okay being average with. We're okay being, eh, it's okay. Somebody says, how's your Christian life going? Eh, okay, I'm better than Jenny. <laughs> right? That's how, that's how we are. Eh, 
Why is it that's the only title you're, you're okay accepting average, being average with? We're okay with being average in our Christian walk. Why is it? When any of us in here play sports, we want to be the best. We train and we practice every day in our job. We train and we work hard to be the best that we can be. We want to be the best spouse we can be. We want to be the best coach we can be. We want to be the best player we can be. We want to be the best uh, parent that we can be. My goodness, we torture our children, don't we? Get in here and like this Facebook post and act like you love it. Act like you're having so much fun on this vacation. <laughs> Smile. We do that because we want the world to know what great parents we are. Why is it okay if the world knows we're average Christians? It shouldn't be that way. That shouldn't, we shouldn't be okay with that. You know, the Bible says that you're a Christian, you're a royal priesthood. Whether you like it or not, you are. You're an example. And your witness and your testimony that you worked 10 years to build can be destroyed in 10 minutes by your actions. Don't be, be the Christian that says, here, follow me. Am I going to sin? Yes. I'm going to sin. I'm going to make mistakes. But I am going to get back up. I'm going to ask for forgiveness, and I'm right back on the walk. The Apostle Paul didn't shy away from it. First Corinthians 11, he said, Be imitators of me, just as also as I am of Christ. Again, you're going to make mistakes. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. Does that mean you should accept it? Does that mean you should be okay with it? No. You shouldn't be okay with the fact that you just sin. It should hurt a little bit that you sin. It should sting a little bit when we sin against our Lord. It's not this grace, you know what I mean? Oh, I'm okay. It's okay. Everybody does it. That sin you just committed caused a stripe on the back of Jesus. That sin that we just committed was the scourging that Jesus went through. That sin that we committed was a drop of blood that fell off the cross from our Savior. We shouldn't be just okay with it. It should sting. So I want us all to commit to being that type of Christian that says, yeah, look to me. Yeah, you judge me. Yeah, you follow my walk. I'm not perfect, but, but I'm going to walk as best I can and as close as I can to Jesus. And when I mess up, you can better believe I'm going to be right back on the path after I seek forgiveness. That's the type of Christian I'm calling us and pleading for us all to be. And when I say that, it's not gripping on tight and trying to scratch and claw and be a good Christian. It's giving yourself over to Jesus. Because that's what the Christian walk is. The closer you get to Jesus, Jesus will just flow from you and flow through you. It's about making those decisions that's going to better your relationship with Jesus. We all do it in every other relationship. We make time for one another. We spend time with each other. We give each other consideration. Husbands, you know you always put your wife first, right? We make time in every other relationship, but Jesus, that's what I'm talking about. Let's be the type that says, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. And some of you here may think, well, gosh, I'm, I'm so far lost and gone down the path that I can't get back to be that person that, that says, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You start today, and you start your walk out today. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 said, wretched man that I am. He saw his sin. He saw what he did to, to, to go against Jesus. And he said, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? But that didn't stop him from continuing his walk with Jesus and to continue to better his walk with Jesus. And the same man that said, wretched man that I am, also said this in Philippians 3. I do not mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved, for, saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am still not all I should be, but I am focusing all of my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race 
and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us up to heaven. If we want to change the world, if we want to change our communities, if we want to make an impact for Jesus, you got to forget the past. You cannot let the enemy keep bringing up your past and defeating you by what's already done, and you can't change. It's over. In God's eyes, it's over. Now you start today. Move forward in relationship with God today. Be like the Apostle Paul. All your energies. Focusing, focusing on what God called me to be and what God wants for me. What God saved me for. Today is what you have. Tomorrow's already gone. Don't worry about it. I'm going to let all that sin, all that fear, all that failure, it's going to be in the past, and now I'm looking forward to tomorrow and today and what I have that I can do for God from now on. That's all I can do. And that's what we need to be doing as Christians. And you can say, well, gosh, I'm just not really that smart, or I don't do this, or I don't do that. I'm not that type of person. Jesus changed the world with 12 disciples. Love God, love one another. Everything we do flow through that. Don't worry about what people think about you. That means nothing what anybody thinks about you. The Apostle Paul said, I am, if I'm a fool, I'm a fool for Jesus Christ. This church needs some straight-up fools, boys and girls. Be a fool for Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and we'll close in prayer. Father, we come to you today, Lord, and again, we're... God, we know that we're not where we need to be, uh, but we also know that we have a beautiful promise is that we can come to you, that we can lay our cares, we can lay our burdens, God, we can seek forgiveness. And God, that you always, always forgive. You will always embrace. And God, that you love us so much that you looked down through the tunnels of time, Lord, and you saw us sitting here today, and you knew the shape that we would be in, and you still love us. You knew every time we would reject you, every time that we would uh, not live up to what we, you've called us to be, and yet you still said, I love them, and I'm going to die for them. I don't understand that type of love, Jesus, but I'm so thankful for it. And we just pray, Lord, that we would desire and learn to live in a way that is worthy of what you've called us to be. God, help us today to start to build that relationship with you. Help us today to start to be the type of Christian that you've called us to be and that you desire us to be. Help us to love one another and to love you and leave the results of everything else up to you, Lord. Jesus, we pray as we go about our day that all that we do and all that we say might bring glory and honor to you that we would be an example to someone to show your love, your mercy, and your grace. Give us that opportunity, Lord, and help us to have the courage to walk through the door. And we give you all the praise and glory and honor for it. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.